Welcome to the New Books Network. In today's episode, I am talking with Dr. Tracy Myers about her new book, Yin Yoga Therapy and Mental Health. This highly illustrated guide teaches yoga therapists and mental health professionals how to integrate yin yoga into practice and treatment plans as part of a holistic approach to healing and treating a variety of mental health challenges and brain injuries. Yin yoga is an accessible form of yoga consisting of mainly floor-based, low-force stretching. It is perfect for all patients, regardless of physical limitations. The use of yin yoga, when combined with breath work and meditation, can decrease anxiety, improve overall mood, and create an overall sense of well-being. The book is full of explanations on the principles of practice, such as asanas, meditation, breath work, and how to integrate different psychological methods to decrease emotional suffering and increase self-care. In addition, there are many examples of how to apply these principles for a range of mental health conditions. This guide is essential reading for all practitioners interested in an integrated approach to healing. Author Dr. Tracy Myers is a licensed clinical psychologist in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York. She is currently employed at Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, located in Massachusetts, where she focuses on the well-being and mental health of lawyers. She also maintains a private practice. In addition, She is an advanced yoga teacher, certified yoga therapist, and mindfulness-based stress reduction and certified mindfulness meditation teacher. Prior to her current position, she worked for the State of Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, where she spent 17 years as a clinical neuropsychologist working with clients with learning disabilities, attention deficit disorder, traumatic brain injury, and developmental and brain-based disorders. She provided neuropsychological assessment, group and individual psychotherapy, as well as positive behavioral support planning. A graduate of Skidmore College, she completed her doctorate in clinical psychology at Florida Tech. She completed her internship and postdoctoral training in neuropsychology at the Miami Veterans Administration and the University of Miami. She is currently an adjunct faculty member at Maryland University of Integrative Health. For more information, you can visit her website at tracymyerspsyd.com. That's Tracy Myers, T-R-A-C-E-Y-M-E-Y-E-R-S-P-S-Y-D. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the New Books Network. Today, I am talking with Dr. Tracy Myers about her new book, Yin Yoga Therapy for Mental Health. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm really happy to be here. So I loved the book. Um, I was telling you earlier, it's like, oh, I think it was written for me because as a fellow psychologist who also really loves, you know, alternative and adjunct treatments, it's um, full of so much information. So before we get into the book, though, I thought maybe you could um, tell listeners a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in, and how you came to write on this subject. Yeah, sure. Um, and I write a little bit about this in the book, but my my background was pretty traditional in psychology, and especially almost well now thirty years ago. Um, the training back then, you know, we didn't do a lot of mind body integration, and particularly my training was very cognitive behavioral because that was the popular model at the time. And I became a neuropsychologist, um, particularly focused on the brain and brain injury and assessment. So the body was really almost like far away from both my own personal practice and my clinical work. Um, I really was working from that neck up, so to speak. Um, And then over time, 
know, had mixed results. Of course, some people got better, some people struggled. Um, but, um, you know, just continuing my regular, my regular work, but on a personal level, I became really interested in yoga and started doing a personal practice, um, inspired by one of my clients who had started a practice himself and started kind of, um, you know, really embracing yoga and decided to teach yoga. So, um, I was like, you know, almost had the second career that had nothing to do with my psychology career. I went to work every day did my psychology. And then I started teaching yoga at night. It was almost like two different worlds, but I must've been sharing this with somebody at work. And finally, someone at work asked me, I worked, I worked at the time in a big psychiatric hospital. They said, you should teach yoga here. I was like, well, maybe. And so I decided to, to start to teach a little bit. So I started um, a couple of groups on the units and with, and I write in the book about some of the early stories, which were not easy. Um, you know, it really was a, a challenge to bring some of these uh, methods into a place that had not had any integrative medicine before. But over time, I got more and more comfortable really living both worlds. So instead of just being a psychologist who secretly teaches yoga at night, I started to integrate them both. And I found, wow, like, actually, there is a need for it. And it made me happy as a clinician. I, I found that I found my purpose. And Instead of just continuing to do the same thing, I found so much more flexibility um, working in the mind and the body. And I haven't looked back. Like that was in the mid 2000s um, when I started teaching. And then really the next 15 years have been highly influenced on this much more integrative approach. What was it about your experience with yoga personally that led to sort of, you know, <laughs> juggling or having sort of dual? uh roles for such a long time like what was it before you brought it into your work that was sustaining your interest yeah i think because psychologists and i know i'm speaking to you as one we tend to be heady like we tend to be in our heads a lot thinking planning trying to you know figure things out and so i didn't have a lot of experience in my own inner like body and physical body or even tuning into the more subtle signs of my body like just pretty disconnected myself so when I started doing yoga and found, oh, like noticing nuances and how I was feeling, noticing the connection with my emotions. And you'd think, of course, as a psychologist, I would know this, but I started to have a lot more depth in understanding of my own feelings, um, little shifts of like, oh, if I move my body this way, I feel this um, or how to regulate. I'm feeling really tense and upset. And after class, I feel so much more relaxed. And there was something you know, that continued to shift and evolve the more in depth I got into yoga. And so um, my natural achieving self was like, I should become a teacher then, you know? And so, and that led me to, to start teaching. And then that really helped for me to, you know, have more depth and knowledge of the practices, not just how to do the pose, but the background of yoga philosophy and mindfulness and how all of that together creates this, you know, shift for so many people. So I think that's, I think it really was, it was my, my lack of connection with my own mind body and then seeing the therapeutic effects myself, um, in a way that, uh, was really unexpected. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I wonder if you can take that a little bit further, either through your own experience or maybe even with one of the many patients you write about in the book, but I think there are a lot of people who hear that and myself included like that that's this idea why would you why do you want to be more connected with your body i mean what and i hear you say oh okay you become a little bit more aware of you shift your body feels differently so what like why i mean you know like how's that and and i will say for listeners you actually really go deeply into that in the book but i, I can remember my first experience of a therapist saying like you know getting your body and everything and being like there's nothing in there i just didn't feel anything yeah well i think there's there's two i have two answers that come up that's such a great question um because it it is it does go to the heart of like what why is this so potent why does everyone keep saying it's important to have connection to the body like what does that mean the first comes from sort of a negative view which was i stayed in my head a lot both personally and professionally and the results were mixed like changing, um, maybe changing thoughts or trying to work on um, belief systems that would shift a little bit, but it was hard to maintain that. Um, it was also hard to access 
feelings and when would a feeling start and when would a feeling end and how do I regulate the emotions? It was all very cognitive and in my head, but when it came to actually doing it, I don't think I was able to do it that with that much success. And I saw the same thing with my clients. I, I might teach them um, to identify a negative thought and to replace that thought. And they might do that really well and still feel anxious in their chest or their gut, or still feel like they're in a fight or flight response. So that kind of led me to this idea much more of like, what if we did both? Like, what if we went into the body to actually tune in? So I think going into the body, number one, gives us a barometer, like a a temperature of what's happening inside. Um, And for some people in the beginning, it's, it's hard, you know, it doesn't come right away. It takes a little time, but let's say we're in a yoga pose and we're noticing, oh, I'm feeling some stretching in my hip. Oh, I'm feeling a little discomfort in my lower back. Oh, I'm noticing my breath is a little short, for example. So we start to learn these cues and then we might even notice, oh, there's some emotions here too. I'm noticing actually even maybe a little sadness here. So we, we're, as we tune in, we start to learn so much more about what's actually happening, not just in our thoughts, but in our body, in our nervous system, Um, and then we have like many more opportunities to work on things to help us feel better. So if we know, oh, I'm feeling my breath is really short and I'm feeling anxious. Suddenly that becomes a whole portal, a whole doorway to do some work rather than just looking at my beliefs, you know, that is fine too. But I really love this idea of the body, like we call bottom up, like working from the body up into the mind. And then the mind into the body, both. So we can do both things. So I don't think one is better than the other, but what I found, again, is that access to the body, the subtle physical and emotional cues we can pick up, give us so many more options for emotion regulation and coping. Yeah, that's definitely true. And again, maybe this, maybe we could switch a little bit specifically to yin yoga, because Um, And maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about what the difference is um, between yin yoga and regular yoga, because I think that that speaks to, and we can, we can come back then to, you know, an individual's experience of yin yoga and how, how that, you know, facilitates healing and growth and supports, like you said, change and insight. Yeah. So yin yoga is a particular form of yoga still has postures just like a traditional yoga class. So I I distinguish yin yoga from what we might call hatha yoga, which is more like sun salutations and warriors. Um, And so yin yoga is, um, we're still doing poses, but we're taking a pose and imagine a very simple pose, like a bound angle or cobbler's pose. And we take that shape. So you're bringing the feet together and the knees are out. And maybe you come into a gentle forward fold. Now we would in yin yoga stay for a while maybe two, three, four, five minutes in that pose. So it's, it can, although the pose itself isn't necessarily really intense, it takes some attention and concentration and mindfulness to stay in that shape. That's and so, the, that is the intensity because having intense. just recently tried it, I was like, wait a minute, it's only been a minute and a half. <laughs> I was Yes, like, yes. Because most of the time, whether we're, exercising, like we're walking quickly or on a treadmill, or if we're even doing like a sun salutations, we don't stay long enough to even feel very much. So here we are in yin where after about, like you said, a minute or two, you're like, huh, there's a lot of sensations here. Right. And when we stay for usually again, like up to two to five minutes, we start to notice, um, physical sensations, sometimes emotions, um, We also have an opportunity to check in with our breathing. So we might use mindfulness of the breath while we're in the pose. Yin operates at these different levels. So it can operate on a physical level because when you hold a pose, you're actually getting into the connective tissue, the fascia, areas of the body that tend to be harder to open and um, influence. Most yoga poses, we're doing like muscular work. We're stretching and we're moving rhythmically. But in yin, we're holding a pose and actually we're getting into the areas that help support our joints um, that tend to, as we age, get a little stiff. So it's really good actually for walking and fluidity. Um, So we have the physical benefits, but then we have this 
five minute period or so where we get to practice tuning into our body, tuning into our emotions, and perhaps doing some mindfulness too. So a yin class might only have six poses, right? You might just do that five minutes in six different poses. And that may be the whole class. So you may not be sweating and like having a a feeling like you worked out per se, but most people after they have had a yin class feel something has shifted, whether it's physically, emotionally, energetically, it, it it's pretty potent. And why I think yin is really helpful for so many of us is you don't have to be like athletic. You don't have to be flexible because in fact, these poses, you can use props and you can do them seated. In the book, I, I talk about modifications for people that are in wheelchairs, for example, It's really just the idea of holding a pose for a period of time, influencing the physical and energetic body. So yin is is simple in a lot of ways because the poses are easy and I'm putting easy in quotes, but it's the staying that actually creates a really interesting experience. Yeah, so fascinating. Is yin yoga different than restorative yoga? So there's a lot of similarities. And so, um, but it is different. And in fact, poses, you can actually do the same exact pose, right? In a restorative fashion versus a yin fashion. So like the bound angle pose that we were just talking about, if we stay in the pose, um, unassisted with props, we just come into the pose, we bring our feet together, knees out, and take a forward fold. We're going to feel sensations I don't know, you know, maybe from mild to pretty, you know, moderate after a few moments of time. We could do the same pose in restorative by letting props do all the work. So we could recline in the same pose, have our knees propped with blocks and bolsters, put our head on a pillow and just let our body open. That's the light bulb. That's a restorative pose. And that has benefits, but it's not the same as yin. We're not influencing the connective tissue in the same way, because we're using our own body um, and gravity to help open the body. The sensation level in yin, maybe it's anywhere from a two to a five on a scale of one to 10. Restorative, typically zero. Like you're not trying to get sensation. You're actually trying to let the nervous system relax. So each has a purpose, but yin's purpose is actually to create some level of sensation in the body. And that level of sensation is often stimulating the fascia and connective tissue and also influencing our, the energetic systems in the body. So both good practices and specifically different purposes for each. Mm. I'm getting back to what you were talking about earlier is being like a psychologist and being sort of, you know, thinking all the time and focusing on from the neck up Um, this the body-based work for me has been a challenge to like be open to this whole idea about the energy moving through your body. And it can sometimes seem a little like woo-woo kind of out there stuff. So I, I love that you wrote this book because you're clearly such a, like a brain oriented neuropsychologist. And then to, br- so for you to introduce all this other stuff, it, it just feels like you have this level of credibility that I was like willing to like go with you around this stuff a little bit. And I have to say, I, you can feel it. Like I would, I would do a pose and I would feel all the tension and it would be just, and you describe in the book, like, and maybe you can say something at some point too, about finding that the right edge, you know, finding the right, but I would do that. And what was fascinating is that, like I said, I, I've never held poses long enough I could feel all of a sudden the tension just, just settled and like released or like something that felt so tight. All of a sudden I would just say like, if it was at a level five, I would go down to like a three. It was just wild. Yeah. I, I totally appreciate what you're saying about the woo woo piece. And I am like psychologist and research, you know, we have research background and, um, and I was one of those like very skeptical people at first too. Like, and I, I'm really careful in the book to not oversell or kind of talk about like yoga can cure depression or cure schizophrenia, you know, because that's not the case, but also we need to make sure that what we're offering, if you're a mental health person, or if you're 
a yoga practitioner, what we're offering is, is um, evidence-based that there's some grounding in science because we want to be safe with what we're offering. And we don't want our clients to um, have an experience and be disappointed or feel like, oh, that didn't help. So I was really, I'm really careful about that. I, I wanted to really vet out like what are practices that actually are grounded in, in science, but also you're right. There's some things that we can't always explain in science, whether it's like, huh, I feel a shift of energy. I was tight and now I'm more relaxed. And sometimes we can't even language it, but we we feel it in the body. And, you know, the, um, the piece would be in about staying long enough to even notice. Most of us, and it's a protective mechanism, we move away from discomfort. Like if something's uncomfortable, we don't go for it, right? We want to like, I don't like that. And so yin for me on a personal level was so eye-opening of like, oh, okay, I, I can learn to stay with discomfort. This doesn't always feel comfortable. And yet I can stay with it because nothing's going to happen in these five minutes in bound angle. My legs are okay. I'm all right, you know, but then I start to notice, wow, it was a five and now it's a two. Interesting. I'm relaxing. Wait, I'm not gripping as much. You know, these, these are things that I would say to myself in the pose and that ability to track and notice um, subtle changes is really empowering. We realize how much more um, is happening in our bodies and how much more control we have too. Maybe you could say something about that. That's sort of speaking to one of those terms that, you know, we use as I call it the window of tolerance. Yeah. Maybe you yeah. could say something about that because that, experience helps me realizing I can stay in a dis an uncomfortable position longer than I thought that can transfer over to emotions too. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the things that is, I think yin is so potent because we're in a pose long enough to notice even like a discomfort, you know, discomfort or an emotion. And then we actually have an opportunity to work with that. So you were bringing up window of tolerance, this idea of the window of tolerance comes from people like um, Pat Ogden and um, Daniel Siegel, who have done a lot of research on trauma and the brain and the nervous system. And all of us have this optimal place where we feel good, where even if something's stressful, we can still manage, right? Like, you know, there may be, you know, you get a phone call that's stressful or you have a deadline, but you're not overwhelmed. You have the capacity to manage. But the window of tolerance, if we have enough stress in the system or we're at a vulnerable place because maybe we're tired or we've had lots of things happening in our life, sometimes our window of tolerance gets exceeded. And when it does, we go into a fight, flight, or freeze, um, a hypoarousal. And if that happens long enough, it takes longer and longer to get back into our window of tolerance. And the window of tolerance can even shrink to a point where almost any little small thing can set us off. And it becomes harder and harder to actually find our, our baseline. So in a pose, in a yin pose, we don't have to experience intensity to, you know, to put us in a fight or flight. In fact, we try not to do that, but we can moderate how much intensity and then begin to work with in the beginning, just a little bit of discomfort. So, and I write this in the book for some people, even going to maybe a one or a two of discomfort and staying with that for a minute, maybe plenty, especially if their nervous systems have been, there, there's been trauma or they tend to quickly go into a fight or flight. And then maybe they can stay for three minutes. So we can begin to titrate, like increase the time with discomfort slowly. And they get to then use other self-soothing that maybe people are doing breathing or maybe there's some positive affirmations during the pose, like I'm okay, I'm safe or even some self-compassion, like, um, I love myself, or it's okay, other people feel this too. So we can regulate the intensity so that we can stay in the window of tolerance, even though there's some discomfort. So the next time we're not in a yin pose, but let's say the next day we're interacting with our boss, and our boss says the deadline is shorter, we need this memo in, the body might go into a little bit of that discomfort or a lot. And then we were like, oh, but our body knows, oh yeah, if I do a little bit of breathing, some of those same things, we've started to build a muscle. And so we have that capacity to bring ourselves back into the window of tolerance more effectively. 
And so that's that translation, you know, from the yoga mat into daily life that I think you're asking about. Yeah. Yeah. I know Sharon Salzberg um, likes to say that it's not the practice of meditation per se. And I maybe in yoga is like this too. It's, it's not how that practice is going. It's how the practice is showing up in your regular life. Yeah, exactly. That matters. Yeah. And I think, I think, and you know, as a psychologist and, and myself too, that emotion regulation um, and managing the powerful challenges that we all face every day. Like that's such a big deal for most of our clients. Like, how do I manage stress? How do I, how do I, um, not get overwhelmed when all of these demands are happening? So teaching people skills, um, and which is really what, you know, I think a lot of this, this book is about, like, how do I learn skills to manage my emotions in a way that I can, you know, be happier and not quickly get off track? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think what appeals to me too is that this has benefits for you both physically and mentally. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I, I think that I meditate to build sort of my, take care of my mental health and then I exercise for my physical health. And this is really, this is really good for, for both. Just in that, like, I I just felt like, can sense that there's a greater range of motion physically, like you can just, you know, reduce some of the stiffness that you experience and all of that. So that's physically, but then there's something about cognitive flexibility that builds as well. Right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So that flexibility term, you're right. Like when we're able to be flexible in our bodies, we feel more ease, right. That allows us to do things we love to do, whether it's walking outside or sitting for yoga or picking up our grandkids or all those things, right? So that flexibility, but then our mental flexibility, our capacity to be with ourselves, to meet discomfort, to meet ease, like to to meet the whole range of experiences um, requires paying attention and noticing shifts and being able to adjust with those shifts. So absolutely, I think cognitive flexibility as is as important as our physical flexibility. And and would you sort of say that like this does help with both? I mean, for someone you know practicing this regularly, you they'll experience both more greater or greater flexibility physically and mentally. Yeah, we and we can we can potentiate that even more in a pose by purposely using cognitive flexibility tools. Um, So there are tools from dialectical behavioral therapy, which is a psychotherapy model for for people working on emotion regulation. And one of the DBT skills is working with opposites, which is like about cognitive flexibility, right? So if like we're in a pose and we're we're noticing I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling like I don't feel good enough. I feel like I'm not, I'm failing, for example. We can work on, well, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of it may be, I feel competent. I feel strong. And I might ask you if you were in that pose struggling, I might say, where do you feel that in your body? Well, I feel strong in my, my solar plexus. I feel strong in my, my shoulders are strong. And I might ask you to focus on that. And then I might ask you to go back to the area where you were feeling more vulnerable. So the ability to go back and forth rather than being stuck in one particular emotion cognition or physical place can be really potent. So that's how we might interweave the cognitive flexibility within a yin pose is to, you know, really identify different feelings and sensations and be with both of them, even at the same time. So if someone is interested in this, can they, because, because what, what you're talking about feels like it. And, and in the book, you, you talk a lot about how you're tailoring and sort of like and you also talk about, I think that's one of the things that's different about yin yoga is that the person participating has a lot of say. It's not like this is the pose and you have to be exactly like this. It's about adjusting. But what what's the best approach for someone who wants to try it? I mean, should they seek out somebody, you know, like yourself who can guide them a little bit or can they, can you go to a class? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so it's a great, it's a great question and, and it really depends. Yes, I think, you know, 
yoga classes can be overwhelming sometimes for people because it's like, well, which one do I go to? And I don't know the teacher's background. So I would definitely recommend making sure if you go to a yin class that the teacher has some experience teaching, like, you know, maybe has a background or some certification in yin. So, you know, you're going to somebody who knows what they're doing, right? Um, so you can definitely do it in a class. You can also work with a yoga therapist one-on-one -on -one, um, who can can guide you. So if you want that more direct kind of work with somebody who's customizing it. Um, and for some mental health providers, they may be comfortable doing a short practice, maybe in a pose or some even sitting in a chair together, doing something where you might do some mind-body work. So there are many different doorways to, to approaching it. Um, yin, because yin is, the, the poses are um, pretty straightforward. You can even do a class online or, you know, it's definitely helpful though. I always like having a teacher guide because especially if you are just learning or you want to make sure you're doing the pose correctly, it's really helpful to have someone there, you know, instructing. But um, after you get comfortable with the poses, there's lots of different options, you know, to be able to do it individually, group format or, or virtual. Okay. So that brings me back to something I was um, kind of wondering about earlier, which is sort of like finding finding your edge or how do you know when you're, um, you've got the right amount of tension? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, that is challenging for many of us. So most of us, well, one of, one of my, I, I talked about this in the book, one of my yin teachers, Paul Greeley, who's one of the four, uh, kind of the forefathers of yin yoga. He talks about people either being, um, grizzly bears or gummy bears. <laughs> and he talks about how like grizzly bears, brr, they want to like do the most sensation. So if you tell them you're, they're going to do a yoga class, they're, they're, they're going to want to do like a power yoga class and like, you know, so really, and these are the folks that are always going to go to the, like the ed, the highest edge. And then some of us are gummy bears where we're like, Oh no, I don't like that. That's too much. Uh, uh, you know, kind of move away from sensation and it can get quickly like overwhelmed. And so I think there's a lot in between that, but I like those examples just to kind of recognize we're all different. And so, like you said, um, everyone can regulate their own pose so that if you went, went to a regular yoga class, the teacher is not going to ask you to say, how much sensation do you feel? They're just going to tell you to do the pose. But in yin, we stay in the pose and then we invite students to look at, okay, what's the level of sensation? In the book, I created a yin sensation scale from, um, from one to 10. So you can really see like, okay, one is very mild, a tiny little bit of pulling or a little bit of stretching all the way to like 10, which would be like sharp shooting pains, which we never, ever want to do that. And in fact, the edge in yin is really between two and five safely. An experienced person may occasionally go a little higher, but for the nervous system to regulate well, we don't want to put too much stress on our emotions or physical body. So somewhere between two and five. Um, and I actually describe what to look for in each of those kind of demarcations, because we don't know like how much is too much, you know, so many people injure themselves in yoga, which is supposed to be this great practice, but because they don't listen to their body or they don't know the cues. So when you know, we're slowing it down, we're really noticing if I go, okay, so if I take my feet out a little further, ooh, huh, that just went up to a four now. Now I feel a deeper stretch in my groin area. I don't know if I want to stay here. Okay, I'm going to back it off. So that's playing the edge. You shift a little bit forward, you shift it back, or even where you place your attention. If I really focus on the intensity of the sensation, maybe it's more or maybe it's less. What happens if I breathe a little bit, if I add some mindful breathing? So we're curious, we're doing something called inquiry. We're like, we're not moving um, too quickly. We're slowly noticing. And that's a great way to really work on the window of tolerance safely. We're not flooding anyone. We're not, we're also trying to really be sensitive to not create any injuries or harms in the body, but we are increasing our capacity to be with discomfort, which again, I feel is so critical for helping our window of tolerance and helping our emotion regulation. Yeah. As I was listening to you, I was thinking again about how for someone who this feels a little, um, just feels so, so very different, like what would the benefit be? 
And as you were speaking, I was thinking that sort of leaning in and just sort of paying attention to the changes and the shifts and adjustments would be kind of, is kind of like somebody who, you know, just shovels down their food really fast and then they tend to feel full and, you know, uncomfortable afterwards, learning to just, if they just would slow down and pay attention throughout the process, they then could make a healthier choice or, or prevent themselves from feeling full unnecessarily. I think that again, goes back to sort of saying like, how does this transfer into like improving the quality of your life? It's like, or somebody who just is hauling around or lifting heavy furniture. And the next thing you know, there's an, an injury because they didn't weren't paying attention to the fact that they were tuning out to the the stress and the strain and the tension and whatever was happening in their body until all of a sudden something happens. It's, it's such a good point. Like in, in, we talk about in yin, this ability to um, really notice the interoceptive cues. So interoception is this idea of the cues that our body is giving us, but often we don't notice until we're so hungry, we have low blood sugar, or we've injured ourselves because we've been straining our back and not noticing the little warning signs. And so I, I feel like yin does this course correction to get to the, to really honing in on our detection system. So if we're paying attention for five minutes on the level of sensation between a two and a three and really playing that edge, we are really refining our interoception ability. We're like learning how to notice the cues much earlier. And like you said, that translates into maybe eating more mindfully, walking more mindfully, noticing when we're tired, or even emotionally noticing the early signs of distress. Because just like hurting, throwing out our backs, when we start to get dysregulated emotionally, maybe we start to feel panicked or we're getting really um, depressed, we may not even notice until way down the line. But if we can notice, oh, huh, my heart is, I feel like my heart is racing a little bit today, feeling a little, like we start to notice way before it becomes intense, then we can actually affect change earlier, we can say, oh, you know what, today, actually, I need to take a mental health day, or it's a good time to reach out to my therapist again. It's been a while. And I know I actually am a little shaky. We start to do early prevention. And you and I were talking about this before the call today about kind of this prevention model where mental health as prevention, checking in before it becomes a big issue. But in order to do that, we have to notice that there are some signs, you know, that we're not feeling great physically or emotionally. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of um, the, the common sort of presenting problem for, for people going for therapy. Sometimes it's that they're struggling with their strong emotions and they go from zero to a hundred and they just, they're just struggling because it's obviously causes a lot of relationship stress to have somebody suddenly just, you know, flap the handle. And that that's one of the ways that you know, I think in therapy and talk therapy, you're trying to help somebody start to be more cognitively aware of the different levels so that they can slow it down. And this is where I think like this practice would be so helpful for someone to just start to recognize the tightness in their, like when you work with someone who hasn't done body-based work, they'll be like, I don't know. I don't know where I feel that. I don't, I don't know. Like, what do you feel before you're ready to yell at someone? I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. We, and if, and if people have had trauma, they may be just like this level of dissociation or numbing out from the body and the body may not feel like a, a safe place to even be in. So, you know, part of the healing of that is yet, yeah, can we create a new relationship with, with our bodies where we can regulate how much sensation, where we can um, soothe ourselves where we can even notice, you know, how we're feeling. So we need enough physical sensation to be able to feel something. So we start to understand that, but not too much so that we get flooded. And that's what I love about yin is that we get to choose that. We get to regulate so that we're not creating, you know, too much stress in the system. Yeah. So just a, a little something on the little more practical side, when someone does this, what is a regular practice? What would a regular practice look like? Like, is it something I can just do once a week? Do I need to do it three times a week? How, how, like you, you mentioned maybe six poses, five minutes, 30 minutes. Is that enough? 
Yeah. So, you know, I, um, that's a great question. So a typical yin class, if you were going to go to a yoga studio would probably be about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I like this idea of about five or six poses gives our nervous system enough time to do some of the work we're talking about, like the window of tolerance work and to affect some change. So somewhere around 30 minutes is a great practice, gives us time to do some breathing, some, you know, meditation work within the poses and really get, you know, some shifting in the, in the physical body. Um, typically I'd say like twice a week to really start to notice some changes for some people, even once a week, um, in addition to other life, you know, so people may or already have a regular yoga class practice, and this would be a great, like complimentary practice. So somewhere around twice a week, kind of minimally to, to feel some of the, the benefit in terms of fluidity and, and, um, emotion regulation. I'd say that's like a nice amount for some people, if, even if they don't have a lot of time, I'll say, even if you did two yin poses and you're doing some mindful breathing, you're going to feel a shift. So it can be a very simple, short practice too. Before bed, I'm going to do two practice, you know, two poses and do some breathing, maybe five minutes of mindfulness meditation in the pose. And that can feel very therapeutic, even though it's not a full class. So there's a way to take pieces out that you're not, you're not, um, you, you're not making it not worthwhile. It's still worthwhile, even if it's not like, you know, a complete class. Yes. Right. I, I think too, as someone who meditates, but still after years struggles with meditating because my mind wanders so, so easily that trying to hold a pose for five minutes, it it's another way of anchoring yourself in the present. Yes. I like to sometimes think of each pose as a mini meditation and the mind sometimes does very well. One of my young students, I was just remembering, she she'd say, you know, in a post, sometimes she'd be like, oh, is this ever going to end? And then she'd say, but it does end. And I will be like, she knew her mind was able to anchor on the fact that we were going to change in maybe another minute or two that, you know, this wasn't going to last forever. And so the mind sometimes needs those like reminders, like it's okay. Like, it, you know, we're going to, it's going to shift and we'll feel differently in the next pose. So yin has enough changes to keep the mind sometimes soothed and attentive, but slow enough to do some deep work so that I, I feel like you get the best of both worlds doing yin and some mindfulness at the same time for that reason. Right. And then somebody who had that experience repeatedly might find themselves in a meeting at work that feels like it's going on and on. And they're, they're just in their physically feeling distraught and constricted. And they might suddenly find themselves thinking, wait a minute, this will end. Th this will end. Lunch is coming. Yes, exactly. As I have this, this way that I would get through yin in the beginning, because yin was really challenging for me and like many of us. And I'd say, okay, Tracy, five more breaths. You can move. You can, even if the teacher doesn't tell you. And so, and I, that somehow that was so reassuring. And sometimes I would move, I'd say I'm done. But other times I was like, oh, I could stay for another five breaths. I do that all the time in meetings and now in stressful situations. I'm like, okay, five more breaths. I'm in line at the store and I'm feeling fresh five more breaths. So there's something about I can be with this discomfort as long as I know it won't last forever. And I can reassure myself with compassion. Like this is hard. This is uncomfortable. And I can be with this. Right. That right there is such the powerful part. Um, I don't want to let you go without asking you to share a story from the book sure. because I'd love to. I think right. every chapter you have a story and it just brings to life um, and just beautifully illustrates a, a change that, you know, a, an individual has actually experienced. Yeah. It, you know, I, um, I've been so blessed to follow some of my clients for decades um, as my work as a neuropsychologist, particularly I follow people sometimes from the accident to later life. And it's such a privilege to be with people on that, on that journey. And as I have gotten much more comfortable using mind body approaches like yin and, and mindfulness, my patients have come along that journey with me. And so it's such a shared piece for me, um, this work, because my clients have been a part of that. And the, and the story I'm going to share is one of my clients who I have seen, had seen for over um, 20 years. And um, 
I'm going to share a little bit about her and I'll, I'll read you the story. So as a neuropsychologist, I've had the fortunate opportunity to be part of many of my clients' lives right from the beginning of their injury, whether it was a stroke or a brain injury or a brain tumor, and then ongoing through the long, slow process of rehabilitation and stabilization, which may extend for years. Laura is one client who I've been working with for the past 20 years. Laura has a severe brain injury and requires total care for all of her activities of daily living, including bathing, dressing, toileting, and transfers. She's unable to eat and requires total nutrition through a feeding tube. She's not able to speak due to severe paralysis. She is able to write and spell out her thoughts, although it can be a time-consuming process. Over the years, I've utilized a, a variety of traditional cognitive behavioral approaches to help her adjust to her disability, to her anxiety, and to her family stressors. Recently, she's been experiencing more anxiety as her physical health has started to decline. She's been having more difficulty with her transfers, getting in and out of her wheelchair, showering, and toileting. When I asked her to rate her anxiety on a scale of one to 10, she opened up both hands, indicating she was a 10 out of 10. I asked her if she was willing to try something different. She stared at me in a way that I knew very well. And I said, you're not gonna wanna try something. You're not sure if you wanna try something different. And you are so tired of people trying to get you to do things you don't wanna do. She nodded almost imperceptibly and I knew I was facing an uphill battle. Her sister, Laura's longtime caregiver and advocate gently said, Laura, why don't we try to do something different? We all need help with anxiety and I'll participate too. Her kind and warm tone seemed to soften Laura's resistance and she reluctantly agreed. I told them both I'd like to do some yoga breathing. We decided to get Laura on her low physical therapy table in her bedroom so she could get out of her wheelchair and rest gently on her back. After we carefully transferred her to the bed and placed soft supports underneath her legs, she closed her eyes and visibly began to relax. I introduced the idea of doing diaphragmatic breathing and showed her how to put her hand on her belly and notice its rise and fall as she inhaled and exhaled. We reviewed the directions and practiced a few times. Before we ended the instructions, I said, Laura, the most important thing is don't forget to breathe. There was a pause and Laura, then Laura burst out laughing. When Laura laughs, it is full and robust, moving throughout her entire body and it lasts for several minutes. It's contagious and makes everyone around her laugh as well, since it's so rare that she ever lets herself go. I began laughing and then realized that she was laughing at what I had said. She was saying, of course I will not forget to breathe. No one forgets to breathe or they're dead. We laughed together for several more minutes and then she settled and relaxed on her table. I began breathing with her, gently reminding her, her sister and myself not to forget to notice our breath and appreciate every breath that allows us to remain alive, even amidst so much struggle and suffering. Each breath reminds us of our aliveness. Mm. That's just one of so many really moving, moving stories. And I love that one because at any given moment when I'm anxious, I try to try to go back to my breath because almost inevitably I'm holding my breath or breathing very, and it's so powerful to just be like, remember to breathe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's just one breath away. And as soon as we do something for many of us settles, even just a couple of breaths in, you know, so I, I think of, of Laura and, and very much about, um, she got it first of all, and she was able to, to use humor, but up to watch her settle when she was so uncomfortable in her wheelchair and watch her whole body as we all just gently breathe together, it was really powerful to watch. And she was able to do some, some poses as well as a result, once her body relaxed. Yeah. yeah. And that's very inspiring too, in that here's someone with limited physical mobility and still she can benefit from a practice like this. And I think that, you know, my mission in the book was very much to that point that like I've worked with people that have suffered physical, emotional, uh, profound neurological issues and often didn't feel like they could do exercise or traditional yoga or things like that. And then recognizing, well, we could, 
do this in bed, you know, just moving our body gently and still focusing on the level of sensation, emotion regulation, breathing, all those same things. And so it allows, you know, people that you wouldn't traditionally maybe think could do yoga to be able to, to do a practice. Yeah. Really, really exciting. Well, I've kept you for, for a while here and I want to make sure that before I let you go, I just let you sort of guide listeners to where they can find out more about you and check on your work and sure. see what you're up to. Yeah. So thank you. Yes. I have a, a new website um, called Tracy Myers, com, And I really put on a website, you know, information about the book, but also different teachings and things that I'm involved in. Um, I teach in a variety of different settings online and in person. So um, that's the best way to connect with me. And, and I have practices on there too. So if you're interested in seeing some of the practices and guided meditations um, there on there as well. So you know, feel free to, to check that out and, and get in touch with me if you have any questions. Great. Can people find out where you are teaching yoga classes? Yeah. On your yes, website? You can check that out too on the website. Yes. Okay. That's cool. And I, I'll also say that the book is so full of information um, and it has diagrams for all these different poses and routines or um, I don't know, examples of how, you know, how you can work through them and, and tells you cautions and all kinds. I mean, it's just, it's really full, full of information. It's almost, I don't want to say this because I'm a scaring it away, but it's almost like a textbook. It really is just, it's just so full and it reads so easily. The stories just um, bring it, bring it to life. Well, love those. Yeah. The idea definitely to have a little bit of research in there to see where it's coming from, but also to be very straightforward in the pictures of, I, I found a wonderful illustrator who really, she did these beautiful sequences for me to show how to do these poses safely um, and get into them. So if you're curious about yin and you can see, oh, well, that's what that pose is. Oh, okay. Kind of de demystifies. It makes it really straightforward. So. Right. Demystifying it. That I think you, this book does a really good job of demystifying not just the poses, but the whole practice. And so I think, you know, for myself, who tends to be someone who questions everything, like, really? Seriously? <laughs> you know, I I really benefit from, you know, all the work you put into, like, showing, explaining how this actually does affect the body, does affect, you know, your behaviors, does, you know, make big, big changes possible um, that really aren't possible unless you really are integrating the, the mind and the body together. Yeah. Huge. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go, but um, I hope people will visit you. I, I'll just say it's Tracy, T-R-A-C-E-Y, Myers, M-E-Y-E-R-S, com. Yep. P-S-Y-D.com. Yep. Yeah, I so appreciate this time together and um, you know, you really your insights as a as a clinician about how you can utilize these um these practices is really helpful and um really appreciate how they landed for you and and you taking the time to interview okay. me. I I loved it. Well, hopefully we'll do this again with your your next your next book. <laughs> Thank you. That'd be great.